Did you boys watch the Tucker Putin interview? I swear all my biases on uh, uh, Putin being just an old guy have been completely confirmed. He is the classic old Slavic man. You ask <laughs> him just one question, especially when it's a, a more controversial one, like, I don't know, why did you marry mom? And he goes, <laughs> okay, so back in the third century, her tribe <laughs> migrated down the coast from my tribe and so on and so on. I know this makes me an awful internet guy who comments on politics, but I couldn't make it through the first 20 minutes. So I haven't really watched it. Have you guys checked it out? No, I, I, I missed it. Yeah, the only thing I've seen from it is apparently Putin roasted uh, Tucker for failing to join the CIA or something. Well, I, and yeah. he said it was a bad interview. Like, you know, I something very boastful sounding uh, like uh, mm. I expected tougher questions. Huh, wow. <laughs> I, I like the, the 20 minutes that uh, I, I managed to sit through is uh, Tucker continuously trying to bring uh, Vladimir back to what the question was about, which obviously he opened <laughs> with the question on, you know, the, the war, right? Why? Yeah. Why? Why do the war? But Putin just went on a 20 minute rant, like going back to the 8th century and just explaining <laughs> the history and not really in, in a very entertaining way. And the first yeah. time Tucker interrupts him and is like, uh, oh, Okay, but let's get back to like, uh, you know, the modern day or whatever. How is this necessarily relevant to the question? And Putin unironically like waves at a guy in the other room and says, bring the documents, bring the documents. Wow. He says, I have documents ready for you to show that, uh, I don't know, like now I'm completely butchering what he said probably, but like, yeah. you know, in the 12th century, we sent a letter over to wow. uh, the Polish about, hey, why are, you, why are you killing all the Russians over in uh, what? at that point we didn't call ukraine here are the documents you know he, he he's completely dedicated himself to i guess and that first 20 minutes to the you know historic argument of uh why we do this or why we don't do this but tucker we all know tucker he wants you know bombastic claims like uh, well one, yeah one sentences that pop off and he wasn't mm -hmm. getting that in the first 20 minutes well it's it's not just tucker i think that might be a genuine cultural conflict between maybe not russian but Central and Eastern European versus uh, United States. Like, I mean, I, mm. uh, my, one of my advisors when I was in grad school said uh, his father-in-law, who was German, once uh, raged at his wife and daughter for hours because he was asked a question about how to get to the next town uh, while they were walking through the forest, walking their dogs. And he went on an hour historical disquisition. And finally, <laughs> his wife said, uh, they're just trying to get to the next town. And he wouldn't speak for the rest of the day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whereas, you know, uh, the American classic line is history is bunk. Uh, it's usually attributed uh. to Henry Ford. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's it's uh, uh, here like nobody actually wants you to ask them how they're doing. Uh, but if you do ask them how they're doing, they will tell you how they're yeah. doing. And if they, yeah. and if you ask them, oh, well, this looks like an interesting place, like you're passing next to a church, and they're gonna look at you like straight into the eyes on uh, the topic of if you actually want to know more about the church. And if you look like you want to know more about the church, then holy fucking shit, you're about to stand next to the church for 15 minutes as it, when it comes to the Balkans, it's mostly going to be about uh, how the fucking Turks fucking killed like 20 <laughs> people here. And, you know, and they burned the church, but now we built the church back and ha ha, we won, you know, fuck you yeah. Ottomans, blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's always an absolute classic. And you like, uh, when it comes, when it comes to even like in your expertise war uh when it comes to like conflicts and so on uh unless you're speaking to a relatively academic person or a journalist or an actual analyst blah 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 it's usually you know oh we good guys we went we did thing or oh we bad guys we went we did bad thing you know it's yeah. very clear cut here you i don't know you're talking to a serbian guy and you ask him about the uh, oh, war in bosnia he's gonna go back just like putin did like 700 years ago yeah but yeah. There's always a yeah, but, and, you know, to an extent, you know, history is complicated and the yeah, but is, is good. But, bro, sometimes I just want you to, like, fucking give me simple directions to the next time. Right, yeah, okay? I, I think that played out in Kosovo, like, uh, you know, uh, the Americans, well, first of all, they were misguided about a lot of things about the Balkans and they didn't even want to know. 
but they were definitely yeah. talking about the 1990s. And I think a lot of times Serbs would try to say, well, uh, in, was it 1379? I don't know, on the field of blackbirds, la la la. And yeah, it, man, you're good. This is exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> holy yeah. shit, yeah. And it didn't translate very well, like, you know, what about now? But it's interesting how it's translating really well for the Israelis, at least in the eyes of conservative oh, yeah. and imperialist liberals, you know. Mm, Who yeah. my book say uh, this my land, you know. <laughs> it's really translating. Well, yeah, well. that's the Bible. That's that's one of the texts they do believe in. Uh yeah, the the Bible in World War II, that's uh that's sort of mm. history for a lot of people in America. Uh Yeah. I didn't really get that because I came from a very devout Catholic family and that we had the old Catholic attitude that if you're a civilian reading the Bible is dangerous. In fact, when when Mark Ames said he was starting to read the Bible, I thought I actually told him like, "Oh, don't do that. Come on, you know, you <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll think it's easy and it won't get to you, but it's gotten to a lot of people I know. Don't don't touch that stuff." It was like he was going on heroin <laughs> or something. <laughs> and I was trying to warn him off it. But actually, you know, he, he learned a lot. He taught me a lot about the the Bible and he he had some kind of immunity to it, so it didn't hurt him. Very interesting. Yeah, I I I I took uh, religious studies for eleven years. On the twelfth year, my half of my class we protested the teacher because they gave us a new teacher who they they did more work in the direction of uh, you know. Uh, ideological brainwashing on why we should hate particular groups instead of the previous professor who was decent for 11 years was just like, okay, this is what the book says and he only stuck to the stories about, you know, stuff that happens not uh, necessarily stuff that uh, is controversial from the perspective of a, of a modern person, you know, because he realized we're fucking children and you should, you know, <laughs> kind of pace yourself with this whole thing. The The other lady was just, you know, a bigot. But yeah, it's interesting how you one can one can go through either that or I remember like again the difference in culture and reaction. I remember like my grandma giving me rakia at fourteen and not thinking <laughs> that this can translate into me becoming an alcoholic at some point. But when I told her around the same age that because she's uh, I, I half of my family are like you know. Uh, from back in the day before the revolution in Yugoslavia, reactionaries, you know, king and motherland, the other ones were partisans. And she was from the partisan family. And her cultural context, me drinking at an early age, me getting into fights, blah, blah, that was all what normal boys do. Uh, but when, when she fucking heard from my dad that they let me go to these, like, uh, you know, religious education uh, classes, she gave me the biggest rants about huh. this will, little, alluding to what you said, oh my God, you go Going on heroin like in her yeah. mind this was like you're getting brainwashed i'm just gonna see you like crouching in churches all day <laughs> like, wow. like, that's it yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah well I, I can see the balkan indoctrination thing i mean uh, we went from uh belgrade to zlatibor last summer and we i mean i was trying to figure out the map as we were going along and i, I thought niche that's niche, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, that's, yeah, perfectly. That's the Tower of Skulls. I want to stop yeah. and see the Tower of Skulls. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, that's wild. You you know so much about that. No, I'm I'm positively, uh, positively surprised. And you, JT, how was how was religious education? Uh, not just religious education in the scope of everything we're talking about. Uh, your family are they like straight to the point kind mm. of hard motherfuckers, or is it like oh now I'm gonna read the whole Bible to you only to explain uh, where you need to find your spare sock right. that you lost. <laughs> no, I lucked out in that my my parents were kind of like, hey, you know, uh, you, you know, if you're a good person, you know, th good things will happen to you, that kind of thing. We personally believe this, but you believe whatever you want, um, which was good. And I, I went to a Christian high school, a little pr private Christian high school, so I, I read the Bible cover to cover. Um, it was never really for me. I I don't know. I just didn't didn't click with me. And then I went to a, a private Christian college. And same thing, like I really enjoyed the the religion classes, like the teacher was great, but you know, 
it just, again, it wasn't for me. So I'd always be put on the, I was the one dude in the hot seat whenever he had to ask the class for like a critical perspective on any story. I'm like, why, man, I don't want to do this. Like ask somebody else. I'm not, I'm not t- t- teaching this class. Now you um, play Satan. You, 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 you exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the number of debates I had to do. I was yeah. like, oh, come on. It's me versus 30 kids. Yeah. Um, Slowly starts crucifying but, one of the kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is for argument's sake. Bro. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's religious indoctrination in the states has its own weird flavor. Um, depending where on were where you? you are. Where yeah, where were you? I, that's what I was going to ask. Like, there's yeah. there's uh, religious schools and religious schools, I suppose. Uh-huh. Oh, where yeah, were you? Exactly. Luckily, I moved around a lot for my dad's job, so I've lived all over the states. Um, and then when by the time I ended up in a Christian high school, we were in Texas. So thankfully, I was kind of. Uh, inoculated against the more noxious aspects of it. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot of places, even Texas, it's kind of just a cultural thing yeah. these days. Yeah. Like, mo- yeah, most of the kids in my graduating class are not particularly religious. They're just, you know, they go to the, the services on Christmas and Easter and stuff like that. And a lot of them will, will go to church on Sundays because that's what they've always done, but have no particular attachment to the religion itself. So, I don't know. There, are, I mean, there are definitely, definitely, still super, super religious people in the states. There, I mean, I've been proselytized to sitting at like a car dealership at one point while I was waiting for my uh, tires to be rotated or whatever, and that's weird. That that is always a little jarring. Yeah. But yeah, for the most part, I would say it's it's kind of a cultural thing now. It I is. got proselytized on the streets of Moscow by really, an, yeah, this American kid. They were flying <laughs> plane <laughs> yeah, loads of like, them. Russian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of Please yeah. go. On, yeah. <laughs> but you know, for me, it's like uh, it's it's hard to explain because I don't think I ever believed in God. In fact, if anything, I believed like when I saw The Exorcist, it was like. How does this prove that God exists? It just proves that demons exist, and I knew that. <laughs> um, yeah. But it doesn't prove anything about God. But you know, there was so much of the family's self-esteem tied up in religion. I mean, my yeah. two of my uncles, one of my aunts, gave their lives to the church, not in the sense that they were martyred, but you know, I've I've lived in the places they had to live, and it's martyrdom would be a lot easier and uh, mm. it was you know the family and the Irish for so long gave everything to the church and really got nothing back but it still was sad to see it dying uh, in America yeah, yeah. A, uh, a buddy of mine I don't know if you guys are familiar with this movie The Tip of the Spear we had to go and watch that like the opening night at that Christian high school. And it was about these, where were they? Uh, South America, I think somewhere, these preachers, like these traveling preachers or whatever. And they they end up all getting killed by the, by the locals. And this was, I don't know, you know, fairly recently in the grand scheme of things. Like, and a, a buddy of mine, not from that school, completely unrelated, like this year, told me, oh yeah, that was my great uncle. Like, what? Wow. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> your, your great uncle was a weird hyper zealot pastor guy he's like yeah wow. i was like wow Small you, world. Just, you never know who's in the family tree well Absolutely. you know some some guy just uh waded ashore from a boat onto andaman island i think it was mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. indian ocean and he instantly got uh yeah the, the they use interesting bows with really long arrows and he got these spear-like arrows just like mm. pin cushioning him but, you know, he died with a Bible in his hand. And I guess if you really believe, uh, yeah. it's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, I guess at the end of the day, it's like, if you can die for something you genuinely believe in, that's not a bad way to go. Yeah. yeah. I'm not listening to this right now. Back in <laughs> yeah, no. TNT no. in his backpack <laughs> before school <Stop>. tomorrow. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of The Deep Program. Today we got something special in store for you, a real educational treat because today I believe you'll actually learn something. Please <laughs> welcome John Dolan aka Gary Brecher 
a poet, author, an essayist, a scholar of war, coups, manipulation, and death, a host of the renowned War Nerds podcast. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for coming. Please tell our audience a little bit about what you do and where they can find you. Okay. Well, uh, what I do at the moment is uh, co-host the podcast Radio War Nerd with the illustrious Mark Ames, uh, and you can find us on Patreon or Patreon. I've never been sure how to pronounce it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we we have built up the program pretty well. It's It's got like, I think, about 5,000 subscribers now. And uh, we have always based it on, you know, pedantry, because we're both longtime pedants. We're both products <laughs> of the rhetoric department at UC Berkeley. And we also like try to tell the truth, uh, which is not easy. I don't like Orwell very much, but I like one thing he said, which was it takes a constant effort to notice what is right in front of your nose. And I think that's mm. that's very true. And mm-hmm. so we do we do try to do that. But originally, I was an academic. I uh, taught at the rhetoric department in Berkeley, and uh, I followed the recommendations of uh, one of the academics that I was friends with. And you know, by the way, our, our friendship was based on the fact that we confessed to each other that we both had a subscription to Soldier of Fortune magazine, which was ridiculous oh, wow. in, oh, yeah. in, in Berkeley circa 1979. I mean, that, <laughs> you, you had to confess that in a really quiet voice. Quiet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, then he suggested, you know, you should, uh, never mind Wallace Stevens, never mind all that poetry, you should write your dissertation on the Marquis de Sade. And I thought, <laughs> okay, that's a cool idea. And, you know... Ten years later, I'm unemployable. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, shit. I, oh. <laughs> I finally got hired in New Zealand, which saved my life because I was just a fat loser by that time, and I was not going to live much longer. And New Zealand's kind of saved my life. I met my wife there. I taught at the University of Otago in the far south where there are penguins on the beaches. And uh, mm-hmm. then I quit to work with Mark, who'd moved to Moscow on the... Uh, Made yourself of, really unemployable at that point. <laughs> totally yeah. unemployable. <laughs> yeah, on, on the paper, The Exile, one of the... I mean, we had a lot of points of pride. One of them is that Limonov was a columnist for us. Uh, Limonov, our uh, Nazbol uh, man. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, we uh, were famous for respecting very little. And I started out writing uh, book reviews uh, and smiting my fellow academics long distance. But then I uh, was in Moscow right around the time the invasion of Afghanistan was kicking off. And I was just furious, not because I was a moralist about war, but because all these people that had not done their homework had been Mm -hmm. suddenly posing as military hardware experts. Mm -hmm. And I I felt cheated because, you know, I commuted to Berkeley as an undergraduate and uh, I was kind of messed up. So it took me five years to get my degree. And I don't think I spoke to anyone other than uh, in class for official reasons. I don't think I spoke to anyone in five years. And uh, Hmm. what I did was go to the reference room of the library and read every issue of Aviation Week, every volume of Jane's uh, weapons, Jane's naval frigates, Jane's That was your true education. Yeah, that was my true Hmm. education. That was going on in the classrooms, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And then eventually I shifted back to a sort of ancestral... Uh, focus, which was uh, Irish insurgencies. And I'd realized, you don't need all these fancy weapons. I mean, you make war with people. And I started studying insurgency and guerrilla warfare 
and totally immersed myself and destroyed anything that was left of my potential career by joining <laughs> the uh, chapter of Irish Northern Aid right when the bombs <laughs> were still going off wow. and putting up their posters what a in life, my life, dude. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> putting up their posters in my office in Berkeley, which really was not a popular choice. Wow. And uh, then. I uh, migrated to New Zealand where they, they took me in. And I'll always be grateful for that because for one thing, as I say, I, I wasn't going to live much longer. And uh, I flourished in New Zealand because uh, for once I was on a level playing field with everybody else. Mm. And a lot mm -hmm. of my weirdnesses got taken as, oh, you know, he's just an American. <laughs> it's like, oh boy, <laughs> they think it's just because I'm an American. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nice cover. <laughs> yeah. And then I quit that to go to uh, exile in Moscow because I married Catherine and Catherine wanted adventure and we went to Moscow and had adventures. Phenomenal. That's cool. That is quite the life. Thank you for uh, taking two hours out of out of such a life uh, to <laughs> come join us and talk to us. Uh, the two the two hours of the most boring experience of all time. But I'm not only grateful to Catherine for leading you to such a, an adventurous and beautiful life that you sound like you've led, uh, but also that she knows how to install audacity, which really helped <laughs> yeah. us this time. Yeah, but along okay. the way, I have not learned anything about installing programs. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Really sad. It's, it's, it's very interesting in my communication with John. I'm, I'm like, you know, staying away from giving like specific like software or whatever instructions. But I'm like, you know, uh, this is a podcaster, right? He <laughs> absolutely knows it. Uh, yeah. But and, and afterwards, no, everything is fine. And it was very cute, actually. And now uh, you actually get something out of this, which is a recording software. But uh, let's start. Let's start uh, the way the alphabet starts. And that's with A. Uh, the Afghan retreat, something that still keeps a chokehold over the Biden administration. We've all seen the footage and the memes, the Taliban raving in American leftover gyms and choppers, collaborationists trying to get on planes, and lots, lots more. What do you think about it? Uh, was it always going to be a total clusterfuck in the context of the retreat itself? Of course, the end of the occupation is obviously a positive thing that never should have happened in the first place but yeah you get my point was it always going to be a disaster or yes i mean uh the mm. the u.s doesn't have a good record but really there isn't a very good record for any colonial power in managing these retreats uh that the u.s is maybe particularly bad at this uh because, well, I think partly it's because uh, the game is over. The, the golden age for colonial empires is past. That's pretty clear. But we're still trying to do some of the things that they did. And it's difficult to do because the badly kept secret of all empires is you have got to kill a lot of people. And you've got to be really yeah. ruthless mm. about it. And the U.S., of course, we're fine with killing a lot of people, every empire is, but we also like to pretend that we don't really enjoy killing a lot of people and, and that two-faced attitude causes a lot of trouble. Like, uh, we're, we're going to smash you and then build you back up again. Oddly enough, it worked in some cases. Like with Imperial Japan, we actually smashed Imperial Japan and rather successfully built up uh, Japan without uh, the full imperial panoply after 1945, but it really has not worked since then. And it did not work in Afghanistan. And the amazing thing is how long America was in Afghanistan. It was the first place invaded before Iraq. In fact, it was officially where the 9-11 uh, attacks had come from, and Iraq was just the war that the Bush administration wanted. Uh, the, Afghanistan was the war they had to do because that was where the plotters of the attacks supposedly came from. In fact, they actually came mostly from Saudi Arabia oh, and yeah, Egypt. Yeah. But uh, the official line was that they came from Afghanistan. So they had to invade Afghanistan. But uh, as soon as they could, 
they took all the effective troops out of Afghanistan and sent them to Iraq, which was always going to be a mess and indeed turned out to be a complete mess. Afghanistan was always a different war. Iraq got a lot of attention. Afghanistan, I, I can't imagine Americans understanding Afghanistan very much. I don't claim to understand it, but uh, it certainly reminds me of a lot of ancient texts. And, you know, if you're really going to be a classics major, you should probably live in a Pashtun village. That would probably <laughs> give you uh, a better idea of what was really going on in the Iliad than, than a lot of classics courses would. Uh, and there's, there's no way American aid agencies were going to understand that. Um, so roughly 20 years after they went into Af Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. finally left, uh, left actually uh, in August 2021. And it was a disaster, of course, uh, with like the equivalent of Vietnamese clinging to the skids of helicopters in 1974 or five, I'm not quite sure which. Uh, but in this case, it was running, really sad picture of Afghan collaborators and their families running after a jet that was taxiing down the runway as if they could somehow climb aboard and, and get away from whatever was going to happen to them. And it probably was not a very pleasant one. But uh, I think that the departure was a good move, even though people pretend to hate Biden for it. There are so many reasons to hate Biden. So many. Uh, and, yeah. and many, many more since Gaza, which is just disgusting. But you can't hate him for getting out of Afghanistan. In fact, um, Assange suggested that Afghanistan was actually a money laundering program. And uh, mm. I think there's, there's a good case for that because there was no other purpose. And yet Obama stayed through two terms. For some reason, he gets a pass for that. Really weird. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Um, but eight long years in Afghanistan, nobody knew what we were doing there. Nobody said it was going well. We Nobody even stayed. really asked a lot of questions either. No. It was just, you know, about the Iraq questions were asked after the yeah. first year and a half, one could say. But Afghanistan is just like, the, I don't know if I can call it like the passive war. You know, there's guys over there, they're doing a thing. We just, we don't really talk about it, except if we lose like 10 soldiers to an IED. And even that, we like forget in a week. Who are they really even fighting? Like, what is an Afghani? Like, it was, you know, an Iraqi was Saddam's, you know. You imagine like a guy in a yeah. red suit with a golden AK, like, and just, you know, he's ru rummaging through the streets, murdering and throwing babies out of incubators. But the Afghani, like, okay, the Taliban, it's, uh, it's from like a semi racist perspective. A Taliban, what's the, like, that's just, one of the because even though like they are very different than uh, you know the classic uh, Arab culture etc etc it was always to me kind of you know never really let's just say it it was never in the limelight at all no, and I right. don't think I'm wrong in saying that yeah. no I, I and I think Americans could identify with uh, Iraq uh, it was uh, an urban culture largely uh, uh, people driving around cities in cars. Afghanistan was a rural Afghanistan, particularly was a very, very different thing, and uh, it was always opaque. And the, for example, people were always writing columns on how few Arabic speakers we have in Iraq. But you know, in Afghanistan, uh, they're reaching out to find. Uh, Americans who spoke Pashto or Dari or something. It was impossible. It was not likely. The whole, the whole tapestry of the country was so convoluted and so complicated that you could never understand it. You could just uh, stay there for a while and then your patrol gets blown up and you probably mm. never know why. But, you know, the, the, the retreat in itself was a, a nightmare. There was a suicide bomb like a uh, goodbye present from the Taliban mm. as the U.S. troops were, the last U.S. troops were exiting 
I think it was August 26, uh, 2021, uh, killed more than 180 Afghans who were also desperate to get away and uh, at least a dozen U.S. soldiers. And that's mainly what people are angry at Biden about, or at least that's what they say, because they say he managed it badly. But uh, I don't know what a good management would have been. Uh, Agreed. The, the Taliban is pretty good at, at bombing places, and especially because this was a suicide bomb. If you've got a crowd of people at an airport and uh, you're, you've got a suicide bomber who's willing to pull the string on his vest. I don't think there's really very much that you could have done about that. I don't think this was Biden's worst moment. Gaza is unquestionably Biden's worst moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. But there are other retreats, like, you know, when the French left Algeria. Uh, nobody knows how many French collaborators, uh, Harki, were killed. The estimates go from like 30,000 to about... 150,000 and, and up, wow. uh, there, there were a lot of killings. Um, because yeah. what you don't want to be is um, often a, a, a poor family or a poor village or a poor ethnic group that has been stepped on by the local elite and then sees its opportunity when a and, bigger mm -hmm. Im imperial force moves in because that force is probably going to leave after mm -hmm. a few years, and then your whole family is going to die in horrible ways. Uh, yeah. But that's that's happened many times. Yeah, which leads us exactly in the kind of next topic of conversation, which to an extent we've already answered. Uh, what do retreats in general, I've always wondered, look like in... Uh, what we tend to call modern warfare. For example, how the Americans retreat uh, from Afghanistan compared to the Soviets. You mentioned that that really irked you back when you were living in Moscow. Uh, what would what did, for example, running out of Vietnam look like? Because we always see like the peak of the war, be it in uh, uh, books, be it even in, let's be honest, where most people get their information about conflict zones, movies, shows, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rarely anybody either writes or shows what you know that those last moments are like and even when they do for example that favorite movie famous movie what was it called now i'm not going to remember world war ii in the bunker with hitler and you know his last moments etc etc it's always about you know the big leadership guys etc etc oh, yeah. downfall not, you know, that... downfall mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah not you know the random joes and uh, you know uh, but yeah the, the, the random soldiers and what's uh, the random people and civilians etc etc on the street when the retreat is happening well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there are a lot of precedents. There are a lot of forgotten massacres. And the they're not forgotten because people hadn't heard about them. They're forgotten because they wanted to forget them. I mean, the Vietnam experience was really interesting. Uh, most anxiety, and I'm old enough to remember this, was, well, first of all, first of all, I got to say, there was not much anxiety for what would happen to the Vietnamese who had been collaborating with the Americans. There just was not. And really? Hmm. There, was, there was a vengeful attitude toward the whole country and, uh, and an attitude that we don't want to hear about it ever again. Like uh, the, the boat people were a topic for years after that. Uh, who were the boat were, people? Well, the Vietnamese and, to a large extent, the Chinese minority in Vietnam, who were not welcome in the new Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. were not being massacred exactly. Uh, Vietnam tended to do uh, re-education centers rather than massacre, but had no prospects in the new Vietnam. And they were trying to get away to Thailand, to camps in Thailand, uh, or uh, somewhere north toward Hong Kong, Malaysia, and they were prey to pirates who robbed and raped all those boatloads of people. Some of them finally made it away. Uh, others probably were killed at sea. You don't. I mean, a lot of things just happen on the open sea when you you know you have no documents and you have you have no real nationality. Uh, yeah. But the the real massacre occurred in Cambodia, which was always just a sideshow for the United States. 
That was where the Khmer Rouge uh, basically decided to treat their population uh, like a body that needed radical surgery, something like an a mm, amputation, yeah. and they amputated a lot of people. Uh, but the U.S. was kind of pro-Khmer Rouge for a while, along with China, because a lot of things were done in the Nixon administration and afterwards just to show Mao that we were tough guys. You know, like uh, the alignment of the U.S. with the Pakistani state against East, what was then East Pakistan, uh, Nixon and Kissinger, there. I've uh, there's a book about it called Blood Telegram. They were conversing, and it's all on tape because all these tapes came out after Watergate. They're just talking about how the Indians had it coming, the Hindu minority in East Pakistan had it coming when they were being massacred by the Pakistani army. Uh, the the Pakistani army was killing also every university student they could find. And Nixon and Kissinger are just saying, ah, they're just a bunch of Indians. We don't like Indians anyway. And underneath that, they're saying, um, and besides, the Chinese are the priority. We're, got, we're gonna impress the Chinese. And the Chinese were allied with the Khmer Rouge against Vietnam. They even fought a little war with Vietnam in 1979. So, this all fed into the idea like strutting your stuff for uh, China in the late Mao years and the, the years just after Mao. It was a really disgusting spectacle, but that's the thing. How could anybody on the ground in these countries understand what was happening unless you were in a connected family? Yeah. You would just try to guess what side was less likely to kill you immediately, like the Iroquois did in the 17th century and the 18th century. Like they, they decided, no, nah, the, the British outlasted the French. They'll probably outlast these American colonists. So we're going to go with the British. They guess wrong. But, you know, as I've said on the show many times, imagine the aliens land. Um, there's no right choice. You, you hug them. You make yourself an alien collaborator, that probably won't work out well. You fight them, that will definitely not work out well. Yeah. You just try yeah. to hunker down, you'll probably die of some alien disease. There's, there's no good option. Beautifully put. And when you see a potential retreat either by the aliens or the humans, know that that doesn't mean it's ended and a lot of more <laughs> fucked up shit is going to happen, okay? They'll be yeah. like, oh, let's go out on the streets, clap, woo! <laughs> yeah, no, 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 my friend, hunker down even harder. Uh, sometimes the, the end of horror is uh, the scariest. I mean, even horror movies, it's always, you know, the thing that comes after the credits that kind of ruins the whole film most of the well, time. Well, you know, like, that's what, what yeah, <laughs> that's where I think of the Armenians. I mean, the Armenians have one of the, the saddest histories oh, of the yes. 20th century because uh, those... And 21st who, now, like, yeah. Yeah, I know, that the Azerbaijan and all that, but uh, the... The ones who survived the slaughter uh, in the late Ottoman Empire must have rejoiced when the Greek army came into Western Anatolia, mm. and they. But the Greek army eventually lost when Ataturk reorganized the Turkish army, and all those Armenians in Western Turkey who had survived the great slaughter of you know Eastern Armenia. Uh, were slaughtered by the advancing Turkish army before they, some of them just jumped into the sea. A few got taken on board the ships, but very, very few. So they couldn't have guessed. I mean, they probably cheered that Greek army, but y you better guess right because you'll only get one chance. TLDR for the Zoomers in chat, as they say, for the Zoomer listeners, were so bad, okay, were so bad that even when war end. It's also very bad. Okay, so uh, moving to my favorite conversation point, albeit problematic, but always very fun. Uh, and that's what if? Uh, we see a lot of uh, knife teeth and voter ballot sharpening regarding a war with 
Iran, Iran, or whatever you Yanks like to call it. Now, uh, you've talked about how this could look like plenty of times on your show. I think you back like three years ago or four years ago made the OG kind of uh, analysis. Um, but please, in, in, in broad strokes, tell our audience what you believe would likely happen if such a thing was to occur. Yeah, there, there is definitely a lobby in Washington, D.C. that desperately wants a uh, war with Iran. They're kind of forlorn, though, because uh, they've been preaching the same sermon for a long time. But I think there are a few holdouts in the the national security state that, that are still halfway sane. And just, you know, if you look at a map of Iran... It, it, it's mostly mountains uh, and deserts, and you, to, it borders Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkmenistan. It's it's a crazy option. It's very very difficult to invade Iran for any army. I mean, the United States just tried to rescue a few hostages with uh, a few planes, and they were destroyed in a dust storm crashing into each other in 1979, uh, there, it's a very, very difficult region. And especially because I think there was a plan. Uh, I think one of the reasons that the sort of Israeli, US, NATO consensus, whatever it is, uh, decided to occupy Iraq is that it would be a staging area for uh, the invasion of Iran. But uh, they bit off a little more than they could chew just with Iraq mm. so that invading Iran uh, became ridiculous. And in fact, uh, there's, there's a reasonable case to be made. It's kind of exaggerated, but it's kind of true, too. What the U.S. did by invading Iraq was destroy Saddam, who was a horrible guy, but an anti-Iranian bulwark. Uh, and in fact, increase Iranian influence all through Iraq. Uh, so that staging area is gone. There is no way. I mean, when you look at Iran now, it's like, invaded how? Uh, in, invaded um, from the West, from Iraq? Uh, it's impossible. Invaded from the East, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan? I mean, Pakistan is hanging by a thread right now. It's a country that is always under threat of dissolution. And American troops anywhere near Pakistan in large numbers would be a recipe to just push the whole thing over once and for all. Uh, the landscapes are insane. I mean, the, the Zagros Mountains reach deep into Iran. Uh, south of that, you get this flat desert terrain. Uh, the only way I can imagine a sane invasion plan is to start work with um, the Arab population of certain parts of, of southwest Iran. You could, you could try that. But you know, Saddam did that too. He tried to court them like, ah, our fellow Arabs, uh, join us against the Iranians. And they just, they Classic. didn't. So Absolutely. I just don't think how it could be done. I, it's, yeah. And I think yeah. the Pentagon also doesn't see how it could be done because they've been resisting this for a long time. And parts of the, of the case for invading Iran are just plain ridiculous. Like the, part of the uh, lobby groups that Cheney and other warmongers have advocated for a long time was the Mojahedin Ekalk, uh, you know, the... the uh, the Persian underground, supposedly. But they actually fought with the Iraqi army and that against Iran, and that doomed them forever. And besides, they've turned into a cult, a very weird, weird, weird little cult. So they're no help at all. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any... Possible anyway. way for this to, no. yeah, to work out no. properly. But why do you think then is it just like plain old rhetoric? And why exactly now is it connected to the Palestinian struggle or whatever? Why are they pushing it over in Washington? I mean, 
um, yeah. to this extent. Yeah, the Palestinian angle, or if you prefer the Israeli angle, is, is very, very big here. Israel has wanted uh, distractions for a long time and wanted potential enemies taken out. We managed to take out Iraq very nicely. Uh, Iran is uh, the enemy not only of Israel, but of Saudi Arabia, which it's funny. I mean, I've lived in Saudi Arabia and uh, at, at street level, you can't imagine a more alien place in American terms than Saudi Arabia. But at elite level, the two cultures are very close uh, based on mm. oil and money, which is almost like a religion for both of them. And uh, they get along very well at the top, but very badly anywhere below the top. But Saudi does want a return for its money because it's bought an awful lot of American weapons. And weapons are almost the only industry we still dominate. And uh, they want something back because they don't really need those weapons or know how to use them effectively. That was shown when the Saudi Air Force went up against the Houthi, who basically yeah. had AKs that needed a lot of oiling and you know uh, five mm -hmm. bullets per man. And the Saudis lost to them. Uh, so, you know, th these are not effective weapons for defense, but they are effective as ways of buying American support. And I think the Saudis want to return on all those billions that they've invested in fancy American weapons. And what that would be would probably be uh, do something about Iran. But uh, the problem is that other things keep coming up, like, you know, and the Houthi, for example, like on, on the other end of the uh, Arabian Peninsula, now the Houthi are, are this big threat. Well, you know, we didn't bother about them much when the Saudis were blockading them and uh, starving st them out, starving them and blockading medicines. Uh, we're worried about them now because i think both the u.s they're starving us out they're starving us out i'm not getting my yeah. oreos i'm not getting my <laughs> right blinker for my bmw man wow. this is real struggle this is starving yeah. bro <laughs> yeah and uh so there you can never quite focus enough washington attention on Iran, I think, to really get uh, escape velocity for an mm. invasion. Mm. There are always distractions coming up. Like if you're going to have to deal with the Houthi, first of all, that's not easy. Those are tough people. Uh, and you've got to deal with them before you can deal with Iran. I, I don't see it. Uh, and I think there are enough sane people in the armed services to just quietly say no. Absolutely. Now, moving moving to the other side uh, of the globe, uh, we've seen uh, massive, genuinely massive Ukrainian mobilization increases, pushing up the age gap and, you know, other policies. Uh, similar stuff is happening with the recruitment effort in Russia, of course, as well. So time for another uh, what if. Uh, mm. How do you think, I mean, you've probably been asked this plenty of times, and I know it might be a bit cliche, but it's a great conversation piece, let's say, even though that, so that sounds, you know, a bit dark. But you know what I mean. How do you think this, this whole thing ends? I think there's some demographic facts that are going to influence the ending. Ukraine, I think, was, was tempted into war or, with the idea that somehow the richer countries to the West, the NATO countries would shower it with blessings if it stood up to Russia. Not to underestimate Ukrainian hatred, especially in Western Ukraine for, for Russia, particularly for the Soviet Union and its successors. But there's, uh, I mean, I remember reading Lomonov's account of uh, growing up in Kharkov, and uh, it was Kharkov then, I guess it's Kharkiv now. And yeah. he, he says that uh, some of the 
more Ukrainian kids because he's part of, you know, the Russian kids in Ukraine. But the, the Ukrainian kids from the villages had a little rhyme which they translate as uh, into Muscovite, Polak, and Jew, take your knife and stick it through. Um, so there's, there's a lot of lingering hatreds there. I'm not underestimating them. But I don't think a country less desperate than Ukraine would have been tempted into war uh, because there, uh, you know, in, in Russia, Ukraine is, is seen as a kind of a basket case. And, and that's, that was during the 2010s when not everybody in Russia was doing that well. But, you know, yeah. Ukraine was doing a lot worse. And they uh, pitied in a rough Russian way, uh, Ukraine. But uh, everything about Ukraine is grim, yeah, especially if you look at the demographic pyramid of Ukraine. I mean, basically, if you take the countries of the Sahel, uh, the population from age five to age zero is, is like the massive base of a very narrow pyramid. But if you go to one of those in Ukraine, it's like there are a few children uh, and then right around military age, the population of people from age 15 to 40 is like a shark took a big bite out of both sides yeah. of the graph. Uh, like <laughs> there aren't any. Uh, mm. And then there are tremendous numbers of old people especially old women, because, you know, women live longer than men. Uh, and that means you're going to run out of soldiers very quickly. And that means you have to expand the age limits. And already the Ukrainian army is uh, feeling some things that had never happened in military history before, like medics have to go in with blood pressure pills, diabetes medications. Oh, uh, wow. Seriously. Yeah. Well, I, I think Holy I saw shit. that. I mean, you'd know better than I, but when I looked at images from the Balkan Wars in the 90s, I saw something that was very strange. A lot of the, the troops were middle-aged or even flat-out old. Uh, and yeah, that, yeah. that was surprising. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of them because of uh, lack of recruitment, but with the paramilitaries especially uh, and with the internal uh, marketing, let's not call it propaganda, it's sold to hardcore proud patriots that they can uh, go and easily win at the fronts and, you know, get all the benefits of, uh, of a good soldier. And sometimes a lot of the, the older generations, which much... Uh, closely related to, uh, you know, the, the, the reactionary sentiment of the pre-Yugoslav era because some of their parents got fucked over because, you know, they had a hundred farms and, oh my God, we needed to leave you with one instead of a hundred because uh, 99 people needed a farm as well. I'm oversimplifying it, but you get it. Their, their sentiment was closer, so, so they would go and, quote-unquote, serve. And by serving paramilitary units, you know exactly what I mean. Yeah, These are yeah, the yeah. type of troops that get little training, but they don't need training because they're used for "quote unquote" cleaning, uh, and cleaning is never fun. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But uh, but there was also obviously a problem with recruitment because was, uh, I heard also from my dad. Sorry for interrupting. A lot of younger people knew how to dodge the fucking draft. Exactly. As well. Uh, yeah, exactly. and that's also, happening also in adults. in yeah. Russia and Ukraine, but I think especially in. Ukraine. I mean, a lot of people in Ukraine of military age and, you know, that, that term military age is probably going to have to change as armies are more composed of old people. But uh, Should be age, <laughs> alive, yeah, uh, military uh, aged. Uh, um, yeah. uh, and uh, they just got out as soon as the war started. I mean, uh, I don't exactly know how patriotic most Ukrainian youth are, or uh, but I'm pretty sure a lot of elite youth, the ones with the money and the family connections to get out, did get out. And uh, of course. there are- In Russia as well. But yeah, yeah, Russian as well. I mean, so we were talking to uh, 
Lily Lynch, Lily of the Balkan podcast. Balkan Insider. Or and was it? she said that now the, the cities in Serbia are full of young Russians who yeah. are ob obviously trying to avoid the draft. And probably those are the ones who have money. And there are a lot of stories in Russia, and I'm sure it's true in Ukraine too, that uh, it's the poor kids, the ones who aren't, uh, streetwise or rich enough to get out of the draft that end up serving. So there, there will be a, a, a shortage of them. There, these are both countries with very low birth rates. And uh, I would imagine that something like entropy will end the war because there's a, just a shortage of people. Uh, Russia has more people, has a lot more money, has been able to make up its industrial shortfall. It's now producing lots of artillery shells because this has evolved into trench warfare with grinding artillery attacks day after day, week after week. Russia has, and Russia was predicted to have no capacity for that, but they're producing shells now. They're, in fact, their economy has done weirdly well because they sell yeah. oil and you, do, <laughs> you don't need to be a great salesperson to sell oil. Uh, everybody wants it. They're going to they're gonna buy it, no matter what yeah, NATO it, it, says. It has been super funny from both sides, both the pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian or pro-NATO, whatever you want to call it. Like The pro-Russian ones are like, ah, Kiev tomorrow. Kiev, yeah. I apologize now. Kiev tomorrow. The other one's like, ah, Russian economy, bankrupt in a year. Everything's fucked. You know, they're, you know the orcs can't fight. But no, yeah. life is a lot more complicated. And war is hella, hella a lot more complicated. Yeah. You know more about this than me. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that. But uh, it's, yeah, when you roll the dice on war, um, you're taking a, a big, 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 big choice, a chance, and, and you may regret it, uh, no matter how good things look in the beginning. And, uh, and now the weird, the weird benefactor of, of this war, and it's a horrible war, because it just, you know, I, I read uh, Russians writing in the early 1900s, and it's like, just imagine Russia in 2000, 400 million happy, prosperous Slavic people. And it's like, no, it's, it's all going to... Yeah. It's all going to be doomed. The, the little Soviet, uh, what do you call them, uh, uh, boxes you bury in the ground for future generations to open? Time capsules, yeah. Uh, time capsules, the Soviet time capsules. I don't know if you've seen them. Mm, oh, yeah. God, some of the most depressing shit. Like time yeah. capsules that were supposed to be opened in 2020, saying, oh, mm. we've, we're slowly colonizing Mars. Uh, <laughs> the whole yeah. world has accepted, you know, uh, a common, uh, uh, you know, uh, socialist system oh we're all you know just holding hands and life is good yeah, and then you see 2022 and you're like oh uh, fuck yeah it's really <laughs> sad the whole thing is sad and uh i don't know i mean i i think ukraine was in bad shape before the war and as far as i can tell aside from scholarships for a few students and tons of money dumped to politicians and military it's going to be in bad shape when this war is over because you just know that NATO, speaking of, you know, when large forces exit poor countries, they're just going to turn their backs on this thing. Uh, it's, the, the, all the promises are going to mean nothing because Ukraine will no longer be a way of being a cat's paw against Russia. Uh, but in the meantime, the one beneficiary of this war... Uh, which has been bad for everybody else, is uh, the Northern European NATO elite. To me, and I'm an old guy, right? To me, the greatest shock of the war has been, well, Germany, Denmark, countries like that. I can remember when the Denmark elections featured a party that said, only half joking, that their defense budget would be one man with a telephone who spoke Russian and would be uh, trained to say, we surrender as soon as the Russian <laughs> army <laughs> crossed wow. the border. And now they're producing 155 millimeter artillery shells yeah. and very proud yeah. of it. I mean, I remember when the, the German Greens 
had an official slogan, uh, beating our swords into plowshares. And now they say, you know, I don't even care what German voters think. We're going to back Ukraine right to the mm. last Ukrainian. And the, the Egyptians used to say Saudi Arabia is willing to fight Israel down to the last Egyptian. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. Like Central yeah. Europe is willing to fight Russia down to the last Ukrainian. You know the joke, mm. uh, you know, somebody gets very wealthy and then they become a fucked up person. And, you know, the, the meme level uh, social saying is, no, they were always a bad person. Just uh, now they have enough uh, money and power to actually act like it. Yeah. Uh, because, you yeah. know, they, 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 they can't be fucked with. Uh, to an extent, obviously, the, the classic analysis, I'm not saying it's wrong, is, you know, Russia's uh, international policy really backfired because it gave the biggest wind in, you know, NATO's wings that we've seen in the last 20 years. But also from the other side, an argument could be made, uh, all these NATO member countries... This is exactly what they've in their inherent imperial mindset always really hoped for. Uh, another uh, strange Eastern horde to be a problem so that they can again equip their grandpa's uniform and march wherever their great Führer, ah, I mean president, uh, directs them at. <laughs> Uh, both analyses yeah. are valid, I believe. Well, history yeah. will tell which one is more correct. But the strangest thing is that um, everybody was cheering for the Ukrainian army. I mean, they did fight very well. Uh, and they stopped Absolutely. the Russian army, more or less. But at the same time, NATO was rearming. Um, NATO has just announced a huge armament program, I think in the last couple of days. And uh, the idea is that Russia is going to sweep toward the English Channel, which is just plain ridiculous. Yeah, uh, how realistic is this? Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what they can't the take Kiev, yeah. and they're now going to take <laughs> London. It's ridiculous. I have the same feeling. But for example, should the Polish feel afraid? <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, a hundred years ago there was a Soviet-Polish war, and. Uh, yeah. They actually managed to do pretty well out of that. Yeah, I, I remember in the center of Warsaw, there's uh, this uh, big bust of uh, one of the generals that it, it, I think it says uh, the winner of the Bolshevik Polish War. They don't yeah. call it the Russian Polish War, the yeah. Bolshevik uh, or the Soviet, but the Bolshevik Polish War. But uh, you know, I just I found it interesting don't ig ignore my you know uh left-wing sensibilities here but it was right in between two buildings that were built by the soviets after the nazis <laughs> annihilated the city was, yeah. which is you know ah, ah okay but uh yeah whatever but enough about uh, nato and eastern europe i know nobody cares about us uh, lowly lowly third-rate <laughs> white people as they say um based on their movements strategy and ideological direction what do you think israel's end goal is for gaza and more importantly let's be honest the palestinian population there i think they want them erased uh any mm -hmm. any way they can the question is what they can get away with i i think it's pretty clear that if uh the united states was completely distracted well, you know, Israel has nukes. Gaza might uh, mm. might not exist anymore. But they can't count on that level of distraction, even with Biden. I mean, he zoomed over there. He hugged Netanyahu. And even Americans, and I'm, I'm pleased to say this about Americans, at least, you know, there's a saying, even buzzards sometimes gag. And, <laughs> you know, the yeah. Americans finally said, well, wait a minute, you know, the we're seeing all these pictures of kids in Gaza in the rubble of blasted buildings and you're hugging Netanyahu. This is a little too much. So Biden has had to back off a little. But uh, if, if they can do this level of destruction with that level of U.S. approval, if the U.S. ever got really distracted, if, if the world had a, a big crisis of any kind, yeah, I think a lot of Gaza and the West Bank would be glowing fields of glass. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, 
So they're trying, in effect, to drain the sea of the gorillas that they keep dangling in front of us. I mean, I'm not sure whether uh, Hamas is even a factor in what's going on in Gaza no. right, no right now. I mean, either they're hunkered down deep in their alleged tunnels or they're killed or they've fled. Or, I don't know. But uh, it's obviously an excuse to kill civilians in Gaza in a really blunt, ugly way. And and that's been a shock too, like the the sheer bloodlust uh, of the IDF has has been a real shock. And uh, so I I I think first of all they are going to try to wipe the Palestinian population out in Gaza. Second, they will fail because wars raise birth rates. This is something that you know they should understand by now. Uh, I, I lived for a while in, in East Timor. East Timor was, until very recently, one of the highest birth rates in the world, up there with places like Niger and Chad. Uh, that was because the population had been wiped out to a large degree uh, by the Indonesian army. Uh, it was a small population, and they really started slaughtering people. The minute a treaty was signed and the Indonesian army retreated, the birth rate in Gaza dropped massively. And it's now dropping to the very low levels of most other Asian countries that are not at war. So when you try to kill the Gazan people, the Gazan Palestinians, you're not gonna do it by slaughtering them. You're going to raise the birth rates even higher. Absolutely. And now they've like at this point, it's completely mask off about exactly what they're doing. Even even the most pro-Israeli, most brainwashed uh, conservative or liberal living in uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, you know, excuses everything. For example, um, this is not ethnic cleansing when it comes to population movements under the barrel of a gun because they told them where to go. They're actually redirecting them to safe zones, okay? This is not yeah. ethnically cleansing a place. This is redirecting them to a safe zone. This is uh, These are unnecessary uh, casualties, but they have to happen because, you know, uh, human flesh wall, because Hamas very bad, they do not eat hummus. Uh, blah, blah, <laughs> yeah. blah. All of these are arguments now though uh they're fucking they're just annihilating rafa there's nowhere more south for these people yeah. to go they yeah. told them go to a place that was the main argument you know this is not at the pleasant they're just moving them to a safe place they're going to remove the evil bad uh, green uh, rag wearing guys and then they're going to come back now they're bombing the shit out of the places that they told them to actually move to from which they mm. cannot move absolutely anywhere else even if they wanted to there will yeah. be no place for them to return to, there will be no family members for them to return to, and at one point, if this continues, there will be no people to return to anything. Uh, yeah. It's been, rem it's been I'm, remarkable. I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think it it can't last. I mean, a lot of uh, American Jews that I know are uh, just sick of it. They just don't want it anymore. They're, I mean, the. the Israel, loyalty to Israel was a, a family tradition with a lot of American Jews for obvious reasons. I felt yeah. an allegiance to Ireland in much the same way. I mean, Americans have this weird uh, double nationality minded uh, mm -hmm. way of thinking about things. But I don't think that's going to last uh, out of this. Uh, there was effectively a ban on criticizing Israel when I was young. And on the other hand, there was open season on Arabs who were always caricatured as evil, stupid, ugly, mean people who, you know, had knives and bombs and were always causing trouble. Whereas if you criticized Israel, and, and this happened during the massacres in Beirut in the 1980s, in 1982, you would get in real trouble. I, I knew a guy who thought he was able to do this in 1982 in Berkeley, because uh, number one, he was Jewish. Number two, he was 
a grad student and had an excellent record. So he started this magazine called, I think, The Berkeley Graduate. And uh, his first issue was uh, about the Palestinian cause because he was a leftist and he was very pro-Palestinian. The magazine, which had been heavily funded by the university, was defunded after one issue. And he mm. went kind of crazy, uh, uh, yeah. just out of rage. And yeah. uh, that's I've seen that happen a lot, but I don't think it's going to happen as much anymore. It most definitely will not. So uh, let's end this brilliant, in my opinion, episode uh, with uh, our fantastic uh, guest with a question that actually wasn't on the list. Uh, but I'm just interested uh, just to uh, stroke our... Um, uh, let's call them Soviet sympathies that we have here on the show, <laughs> even though we have like 10 episodes which are critiquing the Soviet Union. What was it like on the ground to live in Moscow back then? I know this is a very big fucking question, obviously, yeah. but just, you know, just uh, give us a general vibe here. Yeah, sure. I mean, I've been in Moscow several times. The first time was 1992 and uh, winter and uh, because, you know, the New Zealand academic uh, summer, the vacation. Okay, so summer. it was after the Soviet Union fell. Yeah, yeah. And okay, I misinterpreted. Okay, tell us no, then most, about most uh, of my time post-Soviet was, experience. Yep. Yeah, most of my time was in the 21st century. But uh, the first time was uh, 92. And Moscow was uh, kind of a scary place. It, the ice was about a foot thick on the streets. Nobody was cleaning them off and it would get slick uh, at, like someone had poured motor oil on it. And I'm a Californian. I didn't know how to walk on ice. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I ended up falling on my head and I couldn't even remember much about who I was for weeks oh, and, gets up oh Ivan da da <laughs> you fell on ice yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> up, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but until that point I would I I was uh walking around I I was living out on the ring road because I didn't know enough to live closer in and I walked <laughs> I walked through uh Park Pabiedi and I, it was very much like walking through a snowy cemetery of the 20th century you know all these oh, uh, weapons and tanks and cannon and shrines to the, the dead and it all felt in a system that is now dead yeah, yeah right mm -hmm. a system that's now dead and then uh you'd go into the center of town and everything was kind of glitzy and there seemed to be a lot of casinos and a lot of liquor kiosks and uh that that was sad too uh, but you know mainly i was i was kind of uh experienced a a sudden spasm of lust but i didn't know what to do about it like in theory i spoke russian but every time i uh i tried to smile at, at some woman she'd laugh at me and <laughs> i later learned it was because i was wearing this inca style hat with a sort of day glow colors in it and i had been assured <laughs> in new zealand that this was you know the coolest thing because it would keep Top your fashion. head warm yeah mm -hmm. but not in moscow <laughs> you, you did not wear that in moscow <laughs> So then later I went in, in Moscow and we lived there. We lived in Kitaigora for uh, a long time. And uh, in, say, I guess, uh, 2003, 2006. Um, and that was a completely different experience. Kitaigora is a very wealthy region. It's near the Kremlin. Uh, Moscow was, was deep in... Uh, business culture. I mean, business was... It still is, yeah. Yeah, it's very fashionable in a way that in my circles in California, it is not. I mean, I understand there are other there are other Californias where business is the, everything, but not in my California. It's still left over. Sorry for telling you, but still, it's still left over, at least in the Balkans, but, uh, you know, I've been around, especially Slavic countries. 
it's super cringe, but super strange. Like, because I never thought about this before. Like, you literally just mentioned it. Being all businessy and all startupy and all like IT and like, oh, I'm in fintech is kind of cringe to the cool kids, pretty <laughs> much anywhere to the West. Here, yeah. it's like, oh man, you 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 do finance. You like being a finance bro is like yeah. cool and legit. It's like, man, you're you're like you. The finance bro goes to like the hipster bars. Right, which is like super. That's so disjointed. That's so yeah. disjointed. Sorry for interrupting, but that literally like was like wow. That, that that connected. But I never considered it a weird thing, because to an extent, the 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 finance bro, or the IT guy, was the only one who could afford the the Western hip clothes or the uh, you know he's a thirty five year old skateboarder. But because you can only he's the only guy who can afford the cool fucking skateboard. Yeah, well, it, whatever, makes, it makes sense in that yeah. way, like. You know, when when I I went to Ireland first of all, I mean I have I have kind of an emotional connection to that place and I went there when I was like 19 and as I said I as an undergraduate I didn't even know how to speak to people. I had extreme social anxiety and uh I uh, I just And now you run a podcast, holy fuck I shit, know, a twist. Yeah. But I I sort of stared silently at Ireland and I you know, at the beggars in the street, uh, the kids who were just starving, obviously, and the slums in Dublin and the wretchedness of the little villages. And most of all, the ruins of the famine towns, because uh, it was like a haunted house. Uh, you could tell that, you know, well, in 1850, well, 1845, Ireland had a population of 9 million and uh, only now is it approaching uh, half of that again while yeah. the rest of Europe zoomed. And it was an incredibly sad place. Whereas now, well now in, in the last 10 years, uh, Ireland is or was back in the 90s when I was living there for a while, consumed with business. But even though I hated that as a Californian, like it was uncool, how could I object? These people have yeah. known nothing but poverty for how many generations? And now because of the EU, they have a master who doesn't hate them for the first time in living memory and who enables them to get a piece of the pie. How can I object to that? So it's the yeah. same way yeah. with the Slavic world. Absolutely. Some people are like, oh, man, you work for the for the especially when I like Western perspective. Hey, but, you know, you how how can you be a, a proud, be it socialist or patriot? You know, you you're just sucking off of the Western tit, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you are. But the other uh, option than sucking on the Western tit is uh, fucking starving in the slums or dealing fucking H on the street. So, yeah, I will gladly suck on some Western tit and uh, live a relatively decent life. It's blaming blaming the consequences of the fucked up system one finds themselves in exactly. on the actual person who is managing to find them, trying to find their way outside of uh, that particular system. You know, individual oh, yeah. blaming for systematic problems. You know what but I also... With, well, you know what else I saw in the in the Balkans? Well, you know... In uh, in Zlatibor, mostly where I was, NBA. God, the NBA rules the Balkans. And and, and my friend, we rule the NBA. That's true. <laughs> That's true. How, they How can like a guy from a six million people country just fuck, who likes to ride some horses <laughs> from a tiny town go to the biggest after football? Of course, I'm talking soccer football. Go to the biggest fucking sports competition on the planet in the U.S. and become the MVP. That is insane. That is yeah. wild shit. Yeah, that is yeah. wild shit. But no, jokes aside, yeah, yeah, people are really into sports because now all my Balkan listeners are gonna kill me because that's like the the, the main form of escapism that both gives you escapism but also gives you some sort of pride. Yeah. 
Yes. Because we all miss being a factor on the international playing field, you know, Yugoslavia. Even anti-Yugoslavs miss it. They just don't want to admit to it. <laughs> uh, so with this sort of escapism, we, you get to experience both. You're a, fa- you're a factor. You're walking, watching Novak Djokovic, fucking best tennis players on the planet. You're watching Croatia fucking dominate uh, the World Cup. You're watching a Serbian horse rider fucking annihilate people in the N- uh, NBA, right? So you get both of them. You get to escape from your daily grind, but you also get to feel proud of what your people are doing and that's arguably the least toxic way to feel proud of one's nation so i don't fuck with it you know i don't critique it it's better than shooting each other with rusted ak's (laughs) yeah Mm. all right so with that being said thank you so much uh john for joining us i think this has been a brilliant episode that many people will learn so much from um, with that being said, could you please uh, go ahead and uh, tell our audience where they can find you, especially the book that you mentioned and so on? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, ha- I have a new book out based on the Warner dispatches because I try to write dispatches from wherever we're living. Uh, and there have been a lot of adventures, uh, mostly humiliation and terror. <laughs> uh, so this book is called... Erdogan Pizza. It's it's the name is uh, <laughs> from a, a pizza place in Durish in uh, <laughs> in Albania uh, where they they hated me because they were Erdogan fans and they knew somehow I was an American. Well, I have an American <laughs> face. I have a face like a the Far Side Kid, you know, a big blank, <laughs> open mouthed, eye glassed face, um, and. Uh, so this their their delivery guy purposely ran into me. <laughs> it was the only time I've run into violence on on our travels. Hmm. But anyway, so we call it Erdogan. Ah, we in Albania. There you go, <laughs> listeners. There's a long running joke about uh, me pretending to hate Albanians. But there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Race science proves itself once again. I'm, 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 I so, gotta say, most it's, Albanians it's, were extremely friendly. But this of guy, of course, and they are. They are. They are. I just gotta. This do my guy thing. was just well, a weirdo. Yeah, was, that whole. Erdogan Pizza Place was just weird. Um, I mean, it's called Erdogan Pizza Place. Yeah, for starters. And uh, so it's about all our adventures from East Timor to uh, Macedonia and uh, uh, beyond. And uh, are really uh, unpleasant at the time, but funny in retrospect adventures. So get that. And also, you can always hear me and Mark Ames on the Radio War Nerd podcast. And you can find that on Patreon. Thank you, everybody, for joining, uh, especially to our beautiful, beautiful patrons. Uh, If you would like to support the show and get many incredible benefits, such as exclusive episodes, bonus episodes, the early releases of every single episode, access to our uh, Discord account, which has now grown to a pretty sizable community, if I may say so myself, (laughs) uh, check out the links below uh, and uh, become a supporter. Well, there y'all have it. That's another episode of the Deprogram in the Can. Thank you again, John, for coming on. This was a fascinating episode. I had a blast listening to you guys. I just got to kick back and eat some grapes and listen. <laughs> so thanks again. Uh, this has been the Deprogram. I'm JT. I'm Yugopnik. I'm John Dolan. Thank you both. It was great. <laughs> <laughs>